Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this 24th virtual dialogue of EADI. Hello to our viewers. We got a very interesting lineup today for you all during this 24th episode. I'm Doris Obrecht. I'm talking to you from near Vienna in Austria. EADI, which is the European Association of in Development Research and Training Institutes, has been running this format since 2017. Our focus is on engaging with researchers, practitioners, and all people who are interested in thinking outside of the box when it comes to development issues. We want to encourage our colleagues and from all regions around the world to, uh, to take part in this series as speakers or viewers. The title of today's virtual dialogue is The Rise and Fall of the Aid Effectiveness Norm or more precisely the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness, which was adopted in 2005. Our speaker today is conducting research on the extensive field of effectiveness of foreign aid and development for quite a while now. Now, Professor Stephen Brown is Professor of Political Science at the University of Ottawa in Canada. His research focuses mainly on the intersection of the policies and practices of northern countries and other international actors with the politics in southern countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Stephen, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for your time and for taking part in this virtual dialogue. Thank you for inviting me, Doris, and for organizing this, and thank you to Headi. I'm very happy to be here today to share with you my research, uh, my talk. Is yeah, give, give, give me a second, Stephen, give me a second. Oh. <laughs> so we'll have this short introduction. After that, we'll hear Stephen's presentation. It will take about 20 to 30 minutes. And after that, I have some questions and then the audience has um, plenty of time for discussion and debate with you. Now, no further delay, Stephen, <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> Okay, Go sorry on. for my excessive enthusiasm. No problem, no problem. We'll have plenty of time now. Okay, so my talk today is based on an article that is um, forthcoming in the European Journal of Development Research. And that article is based on many years of thinking and listening and reading and talking about aid effectiveness, including doing field work. I did... Um, about 60 interviews in Ghana, Ethiopia, and Mali on issues of aid effectiveness. Um, so, so that forms in many ways the, the background of what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, here we go. So here's the outline of what I'm going to be presenting. First, I'll talk just very briefly what are norms and how is aid effectiveness a norm? How does it constitute a norm? Then I'll explain an analytical framework about the norm life cycle, which is sort of how I structured my article and my talk today. If you're not interested in theories of norms of the norm life cycle, you can just not listen to those bits and follow on the rest. It's not essential to understand what I'm saying. I'll present just a summary of my argument. I'll go over the two phases, the rise of the aid effectiveness norm and then the fall of the aid effectiveness norm. And I'll conclude with um, some explanations for non-compliance and the failure of the aid effectiveness norm. And then I'll turn it back over to Doris. Um, so let me launch right in. A norm, as defined in, in a seminal article by Finnemore and Sicking, is a standard of appropriate behavior for actors with a given identity. And I, I draw in my paper and in this talk on an article by Michelle Yurkovich. I don't know if it's Yurkovich or Jerkovich, apologies for that. And she points out that there are three essential elements to norms. One is that there has to be a moral obligation or a sense of oughtness. Second is the actor or actors who are responsible for the action have to be clearly defined, have to be identified. And third, that that, that, that or those actors uh, have to be expected to take specific actions or behave a, a certain way. So it has to be clear what needs to be done, who needs to do it, and the fact that they really should do it. So if it's something that they are doing, but there isn't a sense of oughtness, then it's just their behavior. And if it's something that's 
uh, let's just say if aid, aid should be spent wisely, aid shouldn't be wasted, that doesn't identify clearly the actors and, and what they are supposed to do. So that's more of a principle, a moral principle than an actual norm. It's too imprecise to be a norm. So that's sort of how I define or how I use norm in, in my talk and in the article. Uh, aid effectiveness, when I talk about aid effectiveness, as, as Doris has already um, mentioned, I'm basing it mainly on the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness, which was adopted in 2005. I'm sure many, if not most, or perhaps even all of you are familiar with it, but let me just go over it quickly. Uh, the five principles are ownership, the idea that developing countries uh, choose their priorities, identify their strategies, and the second that donors will align with those national priorities and use national systems. Third, that there will be harmonization amongst the donors. So those three go together very closely. They work in, in tandem. I guess tandem is only two. They work together. Uh, and the final two principles are managing for results. So it should be based not on inputs, but outputs. And that something strange just happened. OK. Um, and that donors and, and recipients are mutually accountable for the results that it's a shared responsibility. So those are the, the five basic principles and they meet the criteria that I just outlined for what constitutes a norm. There are clear actions. The, the Paris Declaration has targets and indicators. There are clearly identified actors. Each one, it says who needs to do what. And there's a sense of oughtness. There's a sense of obligation to do it, not in strictly legalistic terms. There's no penalty. But there was a follow-up evaluation that assessed to what extent the, 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 the targets were met. Uh, and, and so there was a, the idea of, of shaming if, if these actors didn't meet the targets that they had agreed to set. So that's aid effectiveness as a norm based on the Paris Declaration. Let me go briefly through the norm life cycle which is sort of how norms emerge and then sometimes die off. So this is based on Finnamore and Sikink. As I mentioned, they, they wrote a, a, a seminal article that talks about the norm life cycle. It's very widely cited. They propose three stages. One, norms emerge, begin to be discussed. Two, they cascade. Uh, they, they reach a critical mass or a tipping point. Uh, they're talking mainly about states. So norms can be things like an anti-torture convention or banning nuclear weapons, things like that. So once you have a critical number of states that agree to something, they will sign an international agreement or something like that. And then the third stage and the final stage is internalization, that, that this sort of thing is taken for granted, that we shouldn't be torturing or we shouldn't be testing nuclear weapons or things like that, or using nuclear weapons. Now, they never say that all norms go through all three. They never say that, you know, they must. Once they start number one, they must progress to two or three. They don't go very far beyond this. And they inspired a, a, a sort of second wave of uh, literature on the, the life cycle. What happens after internalization? So there are various other authors that have come, come up with concepts that I'll be using here today on degeneration. So there can be a reverse cascade. So, so states or other actors may have adopted a norm, but then they might abandon them. And, and that the more states or actors abandon them, the more others will abandon them as well. Uh, or that norms can be weakened, that they can decay, and they can even die. Uh, others have talked about norm substitution, that as conditions change, whether financial, the development landscape, uh, that norms might become less relevant, others might become more relevant, and, and they can, the content can shift. So that's sort of the theoretical framework. Here's my argument. So the overall argument for, is that donors and recipients endorse the Paris Declaration principles, uh, but the norm is only feebly internalized. That at a fundamental level, donors were not really willing to overcome their reluctance and certain important disincentives to substantially change their practices on the ground. So they adopted a lot of the language, 
They um, included um, reporting mechanisms, uh, new institutional structures, things like that. But they were not overall willing to substantially change what they were doing on the ground. And that's why I did a lot of the research in developing countries themselves rather than donor headquarters. Second part of my argument is, is after the norm cascaded, so after the Paris Declaration was adopted, the donor-led process, and it was criticized for being mainly led by OECD donors, tried to gain legitimacy and diffuse the norm more broadly by trying to bring in a wider range of actors. So India, China, Brazil, emerging donors, also civil society, the private sector. So that was a, an attempt to, to gain legitimacy, but in doing so, they substituted to a certain extent or diluted the existing norm, moving from aid effectiveness to development effectiveness and thereby weakening the, the aid effectiveness norm. And the third part of my argument is that these changes failed to convince emerging donors to engage, and it caused the norm to decay to the point where it ceased to constitute a norm. So that's my overall argument. Uh, let me talk about the first phase then, the rise of the aid effectiveness norm. This is a little historical overview, but I'll be using the language of the norm life cycle. So remember the first stage is the emergence of a norm. And that phase would correspond to the period before the Paris uh, meeting in, in 2005. So sometime in the 1990s up to 2004. Now, none of the, the Paris principles was actually new. They weren't invented in 2005. These were ideas and principles that circulated before. The idea of ownership, for instance, certainly wasn't new, or the, ideas that, the, the idea that donors need to coordinate. Um, but, but they grew in importance. And this is, this is actually quite a change, because donors were, were and maybe still are to a certain extent, but were, were always blaming the failures of foreign aid and the failures of development on recipient governments, on them being corrupt or not putting in place proper policies or um, not having an enabling environment. And with this process in the 1990s and an influential OECD document was one called Shaping the 21st Century, donors recognized that they had a part to play as well, that part of the lack of effectiveness or less than optimal effectiveness was their own fault. That they were following their own priorities, not coordinating amongst themselves, not respecting domestic ownership. So I think that was a very important phase where uh, at successive meetings, including uh, Finance for Development Conference in Monterrey, Mexico, and then a summit on harmonization in Rome in 2003, donors increasingly codified discussed and codified and, and sort of spread, discussed in, in, in further depth and spread these ideas that they needed to do things to make aid more effective. And, and in 2005, you could say that the norm cascaded. That's where the declaration was codified. It was signed off on by most of bilateral donors, the traditional donors, by multilateral organizations large number of countries as recipients, some NGOs as well. And this was actually quite revolutionary. And these principles had a huge potential to, to change the way that aid was carried out. Um, it didn't actually work out that way, um, as I will talk about later, but, but this was a very important moment where the norm cascaded and the next three years were crucial for internalizing that norm. So from the Paris Declaration to the Accra meeting, which followed three years later, which led to the Accra Agenda for Action, that's probably the high point of the, the aid effectiveness norm and, and the Paris principles. They got refined a little bit in Accra, um, there was extra pressure for, the, for them to be implemented more quickly, more deeply. There were some discussions about the need to bring in civil society. Um, many felt that the Paris Declaration focused too much on states. And to broaden the concept of ownership, to go beyond the idea that it's just 
whatever the government says is national ownership, but the idea that, you know, parliament has a role as well, but we're citizens. So this is, like I said, the high point of the aid effectiveness norm. And it was expected that it would continue. Another meeting was scheduled and was held in 2011 in Busan. But that I would mark as the beginning of the fall of the aid effectiveness norm. So the, the Busan high level meeting was expected to be another meeting to sort of go over progress, to refine a little bit, but it wound up being, uh, to use a cliche, quite a game changer. That the content of the norm actually changed quite a bit. You could call it a substitution or a dilution. There were uh, very strong, there was very strong pressure to weaken the content and the oughtness of, of the Paris principles. The primary desire was to bring in the emerging donors. So like I mentioned, there were critiques that this was very much an OECD donor-led process. And they wanted to, and questions about the legitimacy of the OECD as being the body that was pushing these norms, as opposed to a more universal body, or one that actually had membership, uh, significant membership from developing countries. Though the existing norms were sort of repeated as being still valid, they weren't really discussed in, in the Busan outcome document. And emphasis was placed much more on things like transparency and um, partnerships. Now, transparency is a big step down from the principle of harmonization. Harmonization means, you know, we're working together, we're coordinating. Transparency just says, I'm telling other people what I'm doing. So in that sense, it, it was a step back and an abandonment of that part of the norm. Um, there are other, other ways as well. But so, I mean, what happened in Busan was a very strong desire to gain legitimacy and in doing so, having differentiated responsibilities that, that the emerging donors like China and India and Brazil and South Africa and others would not have to um, respect the norms. So, so it wouldn't be a norm for them. It would just be maybe a principle. It, it lost that sense of oughtness. And this sort of rebooted the whole process, redefined aid effectiveness into development effectiveness, or I shouldn't say redefined, maybe relabeled, because what development effectiveness uh, was never really defined. Now, part of this is uh, very reasonable in the sense that aid is not the only thing that leads to development, that yes, the private sector is important, yes, you know, remittances, investment, other sorts of uh, financial flows are important for development, but they open the door to basically all sorts of financial flows without really defining how the norm, would, the evolving norm would uh, affect them. And what happened a year later was a new body was created to manage this process. So it was no longer the OECD's responsibility. The torch was passed on to the GPEDC, the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation, which is sort of an amorphous organization. It's not, it's not really an organization in the sense that it doesn't have an office with a secretariat. Uh, it's co-hosted by OECD still and the United Nations Development Program. And it changes leadership every two years. And there's, there's always a representative from traditional donors, one from recipients and one from emerging donors, and also a non-voting executive member from civil society. And the, it became less clear at this point what the, the, the partnership's purpose was. The Busan, documents and, and the documents that came out of the global partnership were a lot less clear than the Paris Declaration was in terms of who needed to do what. So if you're not defining who's responsible for what action, and if you don't have a sense of um, oughtness or you know, shaming of, of actors that fail to live up to obligations, then it's no longer a norm. And over the years, the, the global partnership has evolved, depending in large part who's chairing it and what their priorities are. They've been holding more um, high-level meetings, including in Mexico City and Nairobi, but these are a lot less prominent than 
Paris, Accra, and Busan were. They don't have the same kind of high level representation from the traditional donors. And the, um, the emerging donors who were targeted by most of these changes are not engaging either. They're not participating in the meetings. They do not want to be held to uh, certain standards, even if the standards are quite vague. They question the legitimacy of this process. They question why it is separate from the UN and the SDGs. So the, the global partnership is sort of hobbling along. It still exists. It issues reports. It, it has periodic meetings. Um, it has what's called monitoring reports, but it's not very strong in the sense that if things aren't obligations, uh, it's very clear to hold actors accountable if it's not clear who's responsible for what. So it's, it's sort of just limping along for now. It has turned into most recently a knowledge sharing platform, which can be useful, but that's not a norm. Because if you're just sharing knowledge, it, it's sort of best practices. It's, there's no sort of idea of oughtness and no sense of who needs to do exactly what. So that's what I would de describe as the fall of the eight effectiveness norm. Let me turn to, and this is my last slide, to some, some of the main explanations for norm compliance, for non-compliance and for norm failure. And I don't want to blame any actor more than others. And it's not really about blame, it's more about explaining. But I think you need to see it from, one needs to see it from the perspective of many different actors. So for recipient countries, um, though there are advantages to things like donor alignment and harmonization, there are also drawbacks. So in, in talking to actors, especially in Ghana and Mali, the, even just ownership, though universally shared as a principle, the idea that developing countries themselves will set priorities, that is difficult to operationalize. Uh, both of those countries have multiple development plans that are not necessarily consistent and can contain, in one case, I think 26 priorities. So when you have 26 priorities, you basically have no real priorities. That's not a strategy, it's a shopping list. And that sort of empties the idea of ownership of, of, of its content. And then it makes alignment a lot less meaningful as well, because any donor that wants to do anything can find one of those plans that has somewhere where it fits in and say, see, we're aligning with their five-year plan from you know, 2020 to 2025 or whatever it is. And, but basically just do what they wanted to do anyway. And their incentives for not for, for recipient countries not to have donors harmonizing. If you want to maximize your revenue, you want to have activities in as many sectors as possible. And I mean, all sectors are important. I would have to hate to choose between education or health or allocate limited funds between those two and 24 other sectors. So there's a strategy of revenue maximization that, that sort of hinders the idea of focusing on strategy, but also co donor coordination can be threatening. It, 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 it's easier for a recipient country to get what it wants if it's dealing with donors one by one and not to one joint donor um, voice. So they can play donors off of each other. And if one donor doesn't want, want to fund something, they can go to another. So, so there are you know, understandable reasons why recipient countries may not want to put into practice many of the components of the aid effectiveness norm. For traditional donors as well, um, you know, local representatives, employees, they're responsible to their own headquarters, their own national capitals, their bosses back home, and ultimately to politicians. Most traditional donors have identified their own priorities. Canada, my country has you know, a changing list of priorities, which contradict the idea of ownership. Ownership means, you know, your priorities are our priorities, but for branding reasons or, you know, for other reasons, donors want to have their own priorities, their, um, their own vision of success means pleasing their constituency or their political masters, not necessarily those of 
uh, recipient countries. And, you know, in a perfect world, those would align, but that often is not the case. And basically, donors, though, were quick to embrace the aid effectiveness principles, still do not want to give up the flexibility of doing what they want to do and focus on their own priorities. So that's a bit of a brief overview of those two. Emerging donors, and I've already sort of hinted at this as well, do not feel that they should be held to the same standards as the traditional donors, as still developing countries themselves. They feel that they have um, greater legitimacy in seeking mutual interests or, you know, uh, that it's beneficial to both sides as opposed to um, and taking an altruistic approach. They're, as I mentioned, suspicious of the, basically the heritage of, of this whole aid effectiveness agenda, the, its origins within the OECD, the fact that it's not part of the UN. Um, and so they, even if their compliance right now is voluntary, they still do not like the idea of being monitored and held to some level of account. Uh, so, so they are very unenthusiastic with um, what, what has emerged. And then other actors, I haven't really talked about this much, but part of the idea at Busan was to bring in civil society, to bring in the private sector, and civil society is, is probably the most enthusiastic actor around the aid effectiveness and the, and the development effectiveness agenda. And um, partly because they have a more important role in the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation, uh, where they're on the executive, than say at the UN, which is a club for states where NGOs only have observer status. So, uh, they are more enthusiastic, but also it's a very fragmented sector. I have no idea how many NGOs there are in the world. Um, but obviously many, or, you know, most of them are not even aware of, of, you know, what the global partnership principles are and how they could implement them. And then for the private sector, it would be the same thing. It was never made too clear how this information would get out to the private sector all over the world in all these different areas and how they would fit in and how they would be monitored and, and so on. So the, the, those actors, civil society and, and the private sector, but also emerging donors that were meant to be brought in by this shift from aid effectiveness to development effectiveness never really were brought in. And, and that leads to my final point, which is, that the global partnership has limitations in and of itself. So not only is there a lack of will from the other actors to change their behavior, but the way it's set up as sort of a floating, you know, no permanent secretariat, um, led by different countries every two years. Uh, it can be sometimes difficult to get countries to agree to, to be part of the steering committee because it, it's not linked in with the UN, with the SDGs, it's running in parallel. There's sort of a structural difficulty in propagating what's left of the norm. So that sort of sums up what I say in my article. I'm very happy to engage and, and give more detail. If anybody wants to read the article, it's open access, which means you don't, it's not behind a paywall. You don't need an institutional subscription. So you can actually just Google the rise and fall of the aid effect numbers agenda norm. Um, and you'll find it on the website of the European Journal of Development Research. It's currently on, on online first. It hasn't been placed in an issue yet, but presumably it will be soon. So yes, thank you. That's my presentation. And um, I look forward to questions and comments. Thank you very much, Stephen, for this presentation. I'm pretty sure there will be questions and comments from the audience. But first, um, I have two questions for you. We've heard a lot about the changes in the aid effectiveness norm. Let's concretize this a little bit. Who are the winners and who are the losers of this norm in its current format? Oh, that's a hard question. 
So, I mean, who, who are the winners and who are the losers? I think the main losers would be ultimately who the beneficiaries of the aid would be. So, so the fact that, that the norm hasn't lived up or the practices haven't lived up to the expectation. I mean, the ultimate goal was that aid was going to be more effective. And so aid hasn't become more effective necessarily because of this. But I think it's important to actually step back and, and mention that the, the, the Paris Declaration, I, I haven't presented it critically, um, but I do have a more critical take, and I'll just say a few words on that, is that it's not really about effectiveness, it's about efficiency. It's about a model that reduces transaction costs, that avoids overlap, and so on. You could have total ownership where a country would devise a program, total alignment where donors would, would you know, fund that one, you could have great harmonization, and it could actually be a really terrible idea and be incredibly inefficient. I mean, ineffective, it might be efficient, but ineffective. So who are the winners? I guess the winners are the various actors on all sides who want to keep using aid to do things other than development, you know, poverty reduction or humanitarian assistance. Um, so the, the actors, and I think all of the actors I named could fall into this category, not all blanket all the time or anything, but, but those that, that have practices and desires to use a, um, in ways that meet other interests, I think they could be considered winners from their own perspective. From their own perspective. Um, would you, could, could you explain in a few words, uh, if, because I'm not sure if everyone knows the exact difference between effectiveness and efficiency. So effectiveness would be sort of on the ground, how aid achieves results, that it you know, helps more people or strengthens institutions better or creates you know, greater gender equality, that would be effectiveness. Efficiency would be more in terms of um, costing less money or having less overlap or contradictions that it, it would, um, that the pieces would fit together in terms of the process whereas effectiveness really would be about the long-term outcome and eventual impact. So the difference between strategic and operative um, goals or directions. Okay, um, one, you, one viewer already asked, yes, sure, you can type your questions in the chat room or you, someone already raised his hand. You can also switch on your microphone if you want to ask the question via a microphone. Uh, a second question from me. In your paper, you now have called the former norm of aid effectiveness an agenda of with diluted standards, that there are too many actors with too many different interests. This accusation to be somewhat broad is something that is known under the sustainable development goals as well. How would you compare these two frameworks or norms? Yeah, I mean, I think a similar problem that I highlighted, you know, with the development plan and in, in, I think it was Mali that had 26 priorities. I'd say the SDGs have too many priorities as well. And, um, and again, I wouldn't have to, I wouldn't want to be the one who had to choose between, you know, which ones to cut or anything like that. But it's just when you make everything a priority, nothing is a priority. And it allows actors to just do an SDG wash. Um, so, so, you know, if I want to work in maternal health, and that's what I already wanted to do, I can say, well, I'm working towards SDG, and I can't remember which one it is, but, you know, I can just give the number. Or if I want to work in whatever it is, I can pick an SDG that whatever I choose can align with. So I think that's sort of a flaw in, in trying to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, we wind up basically enabling a lot of virtue signaling in terms of aligning with international instruments or priorities, but without really changing the behavior of actors. Thank you. Yeah, we already got the questions in the chat box. We got one from Luis Ma, thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Stephen, for your insightful presentation. First question, how do you relate the emergence of POSSD in simultaneously with the degeneration of the aid effectiveness agenda? Okay, was that TOSSD? Yeah. yeah. So total other, was, <laughs> it's, it's other forms of, um, no, it's non-ODA, non-official development assistance that can support. So, so, so I, I didn't, I, I'm not actually looking at the chat. <laughs> so I think there's too much going on in the chat. It will distract. <laughs> but, yeah. um, so, so the question is, how do I explain the emergence of, of TOSD? Simultaneously? With the degeneration of the aid effectiveness agenda. Yeah, so, so I think that's part of the same process whereby um, donors want to include as much as possible. And we've, we've seen that with attempts to redefine what can be included in, in ODA, what can count as official development assistance, and then the creation of other categories where it allows donor countries to claim more of the spending that's already taking place as quote unquote developmental. So I think that's part, and, and that's something we're seeing a lot with the SDGs as well. And this whole idea that we're gonna go from billions to trillions and unlock all this money that's in the private sector. But I think it's, it's there's a lot of wishful thinking about how much of these flows actually do create development as opposed to investing in an upscale shopping center or a gated community or something like that. Um, but I do see it as part of the same process in terms of broadening definitions in order to include as much as possible to get the numbers up, to get the percentage of gross national income up, um, to make it seem like more is being done without actually giving more ODA. Thanks, Louise. Is your question answered? I will ask uh, ne the next one from, from Chung Kit Lee. Um, he also thanks you. And in your opinion, what is the role of United Nations system and its agencies in the compliance of the norm? The projects and programs implemented by United Nations agency try to achieve certain norms su such as national local ownership, harmonization, etc at least they recognize the importance of the norms. Do you think they could bring different donors and stakeholders closer to the norm? So, I mean, one really interesting thing was the creation of the UN Development Cooperation Forum out of the General Assembly. And I think that was an important actor or had the potential to replace the OECD DAC and sort of become the, the place where global standards and norms were discussed around development cooperation. But I think it hasn't lived up to that potential. I don't know enough to say why. Is it weaknesses within the Secretariat? Is it underfunding? Is it the fact that I think they only meet every two years? But certainly, if we're going to have some sort of supranational body that discusses norms and practices and so on, it should be a UN one more than it is um, the OECD. And, you know, I, I love the OECD website. I use their stats all the time, but it is a little bit strange that the OECD is the guardian of all this data as opposed to say the, the UN. Yes, um, I hope this question is answered. Harsh Vasani, you wanted to ask a question. You, you raised your hand. You can switch on your microphone if you want to, to ask. Oh, hi. Uh, am I audible, hi. though? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Stephen Brown for the wonderful presentation. And uh, I look forward to reading the paper. Uh, I have just two questions. Uh, if I'm not wrong, somewhere you mentioned that uh, the change from aid effectiveness to donor, uh, sorry, development effectiveness kind of dilutes the whole purpose and uh, weakens it. Uh, I was under the impression that the change from aid effectiveness to development effectiveness kind of brings uh, the emerging donors under the umbrella. And the purpose behind this shift was to bring India and China under the effectiveness agenda. If you can, can, if you can uh, shed some light on it, uh, I, I believe that they have not defined development effectiveness and it's, it's intentional not to define it. 
and the second question is that uh, how do you see the emergence of uh, more geo economic and economic statecraft policies of non traditional donors like india and china and uh, what impact does obviously have a negative impact but what other kind of impacts does it have on the aid effectiveness agenda thank you okay good questions so so to take the first one um yes i i agree that you know the the widening of the concept from aid to development effectiveness was in large part for for china and india and other emerging donors but those donors in the end didn't sign on or didn't or lost interest and in fact india and china stopped participating in in the global partnership um high level meetings um so they they just chose not to engage so it's sort of like a compromise was made to bring them in but then they didn't come in so you're left with just the dilution of of the principle and then second question what's the impact um very hard to make a generalization across you know two important and and two important donors that are only growing in importance um i guess I mean, I wouldn't want to make generalizations about the quality of their aid and in fact when when I study aid effectiveness I'm not really looking at the project level and saying you know drilling wells in Mozambique was a good thing and doing this and whatever it's not been a good thing but in terms of from the perspective of recipient countries and I apologize for using the old fashioned terminology of donor and recipient we can get into a whole other debate on what the terminology should be but um I'm just trying to to keep it simple I just want to flag that these I'm aware that these are problematic terms but so in terms of the impact so from the perspective of recipient countries having more donors especially ones that are not very interested in coordinating like China and and India are not particularly interested in coordinating with other donors and when they have in country working groups in certain sectors or you know donor coordination meetings in general in most places India and China if they're present do not participate in these meetings from the point of view of the recipient country this is actually an advantage from from the point of view of the government because they can shop around play donors against each other there was a study from from ODI in London that called this the age of choice so part of part of the danger of the paris agreement was that it could lead to a cartelization of of donors so if you if you get all the donors speaking with one voice that actually changes the power dynamic in favor of the donors and part of the point of the paris declaration was to not do that was to actually you know empower ownership so there are some contradictory effects now from the point so i said it it's good from the point of view of the governments of developing countries of recipient countries but to go back to doris's first question and you know who are the losers the question then is is this good for common people for you know beneficiaries of what these aid programs would be and without wanting to generalize across multiple donors in multiple countries and so on i would just sort of say it depends so much can depend on what kind of projects these are and and how they're designed and how they're put in place so it it could have a a huge range of impact or lack thereof yes the role of china and the emerging countries um, emerging states is somewhat interest for the audience there is a second question on china isn't china as an outsider challenger for traditional donors arenas the main reason for the collapse for this norm of aid effectiveness for recipient countries china represents funding with no conditions unlike most oecd donors and for, this, for traditional donors China is competing to influence in strategic regions for the UE being Africa so you cannot use aid in the same way more geopolitical Okay so very interesting comments and I would agree to a certain extent but I would say that this is less and less true I would say that uh traditional donors are becoming more like China and China is becoming more like traditional donors there is a kind of convergence and this idea that there are no conditions other than not recognizing taiwan um is less and less true i think china increasingly understands that for 
development cooperation to work, you need some element of stability or the rule of law or good governance, not democracy, but some form of good governance. You know, so for contracts to be respected. So if Chinese companies are signing contracts in country X, they want the kind of legal administrative environment where the terms of those contracts will be respected. So I think, so China and other donors are increasingly recognized that some conditions are actually useful to have in place. Um, and I'd say the other side of the convergence is that um, traditional donors are becoming more unevenly, but are becoming more strategic about who they are prioritizing, what sectors they're working in. One area that I've done research in is um, Canadian foreign aid in the mining sector. And I've recently published an article in the Development Policy Review looking at Can Canadian foreign aid and mining in Peru and looking specifically at the concept of, of ownership. And uh, so this characterization of, you know, China just wants contracts for its companies and Western aid is, you know, more altruistic. Well, Western aid can also be looking out for contracts for its own companies. And I think with the decline of the Paris principles, with the rise of China, um, probably also related to the global financial crisis in 2008, I think this idea of mutual benefits has grown in importance. So that's why I'd say that China is becoming less stereotypically like China and, and there's been a convergence. But would you say that China is only emerging economies or do you see a political development aspect as well from them? Especially in Sub-Saharan Africa where they're very active. So I didn't understand the question. Um, would you see China is, um, is only trying to, to, to drive forward their economies in, uh, with their engagement in Sub-Saharan Africa? Or do you see that there is a political development aspect as well, which they are following? So again, I'm very hesitant to make huge generalizations about China, especially we, we say China like it's one actor. Mm -hmm. But when we say China, it's the central government. And even if it's the central government, it can be the Ministry of Commerce, it can be the aid agency, it can be the Exim Bank, they're you know, provincial governments, they're private companies, there are some NGOs, there's the Jack Ma Foundation. There's, and um, so, I, so I don't want to make any sort of monolithic comments. And, and I'd say that a variety of actors have a variety of, of goals and Yes, China is, you know, if you look at the sort of the set of emerging and traditional donors is one of the more self-interested donors, but so is the US um, and so is France. And I'd also say that um, I think that I don't really have any evidence to back this up. So I'm not going to say something that I'd rather not be quoted on. And it's probably silly of me to say this in a recording that will go on the website. But so without any evidence and, and you know, based on impressions, I would say that um, altruism is becoming um, a more important, is growing within the set of activities that we could call Chinese aid. Um, one thing that I think is really important when we compare China to traditional donors is that we keep in mind that when we talk about Chinese aid, we're not really only talking about ODA, we're talking about aid and trade and investment. And if we're gonna compare that to traditional donors or Western countries, we also need to compare it to aid, trade and investment. So that means, you know, look at what Canadian mining companies are doing all around the world. And if you wanna, you know, fault China for certain corporate practices, well, that's also fault. Um, Canadian mining companies or oil companies from the Netherlands or the US or wherever. Mikey, I've seen your question. I just have one myself um, before because it, it, it's fitting here. You're talking about the emerging states, but you always mention Brazil, India, China, and South Africa. There is one missing. I have I, I have to say, I have no idea what's Russia's position on Western development policy today. Where is Russia in this whole discourse? Yeah, um, I think Russia got trapped in the BRICS acronym <laughs> and it never really fit with the other members of the BRICS 
because it was never a quote unquote third world country. It was the center of the second world. And, you know, it was never part of the third world. It was, you know, already an industrialized nation. Um, but, the, but the question is a good one and one that has been understudied. Um, there, so within the OECD, there's an attempt to quote unquote socialize emerging donors into the OECD mindset and frameworks and so on. Uh, in the case of South Korea, uh, I mean, it's interesting that South Korea is a former developing country, former recipient of foreign aid. They've gone the OECD route. They've joined the OECD. They've joined the Inner Club of Donors, which is the DAC, the Development Assistance Committee, whereas um, other countries haven't and, and have no intention of doing so. The United Arab Emirates is closely involved with the OECD and interested in the DAC, so they might be socializing towards the traditional donor model. Whereas Brazil has not wanted to do, wanted to have anything to do with that. Um, though, you know, with changes of government, that can, that can change as well. So Russia, I know very little about it, but has been sort of having high level contacts with the OECD and specifically with USAID, I think, the main American aid agency. So there was a time where it seemed like they would follow the Western donor model, at least to a certain extent, I think their regional focus would be what is often referred to as the near abroad. Um, but depending on geopolitics, you know, the evolving international situation, they could be more involved elsewhere. But I'm, I'm not really familiar with any statistics um, and, you know, sort of clear plans. The OECD has also tried to socialize China and has had like meetings, but it's less clear how effective that is. And, and that's part of the reason why emerging donors are suspicious of the OECD. Mm -hmm. it's like, you talk about, and they say it openly, like trying to socialize us into being like you. Um, mm -hmm. Michael, thanks for your patience. Here's your question. Has there been a switch from budget support to project support? How is aid evaluation done currently? One major outcome of Paris Agreement was joint evaluation to avoid overwhelming the staff of government involved in donor coordination. Okay, so... More questions. <laughs> along with the Paris... I mean, the best representation of the spirit of Paris is joint budget support. So where donors get together, pool funds, and hand them over to um, a recipient government, or it could be the general funds, or it could be sector specific, like the Ministry of Health, or the Ministry of Education, uh, based on some kind of plan and, and how this, the money would be spent and, and what kind of monitoring and evaluation would take place. So that very much embodies the, the spirit of, of Paris. And uh, the, the use of budget support increased um, exponentially, uh, especially in Europe, uh, from European donors and from the EU. But it fell out of fashion. It, whenever there was some kind of abuse, you know, the president spent $10 million on a jet plane for his personal use or something like that, or some corruption scandal or human rights abuse, it became a tap that became quite easy to turn on and off. So when you have a project over five years supporting the Ministry of Local Development, decentralization program or something, and you have people in the field and, and you can't just turn off the tap. But when you're you know, gonna transfer $10 million, $50 million on July 21st, and then you decide not to, you can just block the payment. So in a sense that also increased the power of donors by having this off switch that they could flick so easily and inserted them into a very sort of high level dialogue with the government in terms of, so, so in that sense, it kind of increased the power of, of conditionality and of micromanaging. Uh, so it was very much a double-edged sword. And as I mentioned, it's, it's fallen out of favor and uh, been reduced drastically 
and I would link that to the decline of, of the aid effectiveness norms. Now, there was another part to the question. Um, the second part was, how is aid evaluation done currently? And that one major outcome of the agreement was the joint evaluation. And if there right. was a switch from budget support to project support, but yet. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, again, it's very hard to generalize across all donors how they're doing evaluation. Uh, but I can refer to the evaluation of the Paris Declaration, which is something that I didn't mention during my talk. So they, they had a very lengthy, in-depth process whereby, uh, so it was signed in 2005, there were all these targets, there were 13 targets to be achieved by 2010. They did an evaluation, uh, the results were published in 2010, 2011, and of the 13, they only met one. And they, and, and not by a whole lot. And, um, and then they never did any more evaluations. <laughs> so um, those targets were completely abandoned. And then the, the subsequent ones um, are, in many cases, very vague. So if you look at the ones that came out of Busan and the Global Partnership, it just says, you know, the goal is in, 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 uh, progress through time. And um, I looked at one of the evaluation reports and the results are so vague. The monitoring is very hard to follow in part because there are no real indicators. And in, in, if you read carefully, and I think the report is, does not just do the simple chart where it says this goal wasn't met yes or no, because they're trying to hide the fact that they weren't. Um, some of the indicators have actually gone backwards. Michael, is your question answered? There is another one. What is your opinion in terms of Brexit in accordance to effectiveness of multilateral aid program? Has it highly significant impact? If yes, positive or negative? Oh my. <laughs> well, I'm not a specialist in, in UK aid. I'm sure there are many people on this call who are better placed to, to answer this than me. But let me take a stab at it. Um, I think the signs coming out of the UK are actually very bad, certainly in the discussions and the motivation for abolishing DFID as a separate department and integrating it into the FCO, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. I read the comments of Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who said that it was absurd that, you know, Zambia was getting more money from, from the British development budget than Ukraine because Ukraine was so much more important strategically. And that I found very disconcerting for many reasons. Well, partly because British legislation says that, it's, that aid money is for poverty reduction, it's not for British strategic or commercial interests. But also because, I don't know the statistics, but you know, 50% of Zambians live in poverty and 0.05% of, of Ukrainians live in poverty or something like that. And there's just seemed to be a lack of understanding. And, and I mean, the, the whole idea of Brexit and global Britain and, and re-engaging seems to be, and, and even disturbing comments about Empire 2.0, seem to be about using foreign aid to meet British strategic interests. And so subverting the fundamental principles of foreign aid. So to me, that can only have a negative impact on the British aid program. Already internal evaluations were showing that DFID was spending aid money well, um, you know, independent evaluations, but that the other departments that were spending the money, including the FCO, but also the Department of Defense, were not achieving very good results with aid money. So, so I think Brexit and now this merger sort of suggests that there's gonna be a decline in, in sort of British, in, in the quality of British aid, which already was declining, but will, will decline further. Okay, I hope all questions are answered by now because our time is running out and we must end our virtual dialogue for today on the rise and fall of the aid effectiveness norm. A big thanks to you, Professor Stephen Brown from the University of Ottawa in Canada for taking this time to present your research and your insight into this situation. Also, thanks to anyone who joined us for this presentation. Thank you for all your, all your questions and your comments.
they are the virtual dialogue series goes on so look out for it at the website and at the social media channels on facebook and twitter the website is www.eadi.org i hope we will read and see each other again somewhere someday soon enjoy your day and a goodbye thank you very much bye bye